Greetings, greetings, lovely students. Brian Doak here, George Fox University. We reach a critical point in our course, in our study, uh, and in this series of lectures um, through the topic, Christianity and the Problem of Evil, particularly in this lecture, the question, does Jesus solve the theodicy problem? Maybe when Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, we've, we've, we've trudged through some things in the past in the Old Testament, um, a lot of it was act consequence oriented. You sin and thus you suffer on that basis. That was a very primary theme. Maybe though when we get to the New Testament, we'll find an answer that's more satisfying, something more nuanced, something that's different. Um, indeed, we're gonna find um, through this lecture and then through the next one as well, which is gonna be looking at other parts of the New Testament, different models, models that are, are, are fascinating um, for thinking about the problem of evil. Why do people suffer? Why do innocent people suffer? Do innocent people suffer? Is everyone just guilty and we just live in a world of suffering? How does this all work out? Indeed, by the time we reach Jesus, who is, for Christians, the center of faith, we may want to just pick up one statement or another of Jesus's and sort of, you know, parade it out there as like the solution to the theodicy problem. And after all, this wouldn't be such a strange thing for a Christian to do. For Christians, Jesus is the center of faith. Jesus is God and human in, Christ, in basic Orthodox Christian theology. And thus, if you've got God himself in the person walking around on earth talking, you better listen, you know, if you're a Christian. Like if Jesus says things, you gotta pay attention to Jesus' teachings as a Christian, right? I know for a lot of Christians, or I think of like my own Christian upbringing, such as it was when I was a child, it's kind of like, I don't think I really cared that much about Jesus' teachings and his life. It was more just like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's one, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the story of Jesus. They're just kind of one big boring prologue until the main event, namely Jesus' death and resurrection. And, and thus, if I believe in Jesus, I can, I can be saved. And somehow Jesus kind of took care of whatever kind of problem I had with God. And thus, that's, you know, that's just the main point right there. And certainly, of course, in Christian thinking, um, Jesus' resurrection is supremely important. But Jesus' own words and actions and teachings are not just to be trifled with or thrown away. Okay, so we're going to look at both in this lecture, Jesus' teaching, his, his teachings and his words and his actions, as, particularly as they regard this problem of evil or suffering as we've been studying it. Um, and we're also, though, going to look at, at, at the issue of Jesus' death and resurrection, because Jesus is the, the Christian Bible's primary example of an unjust sufferer, someone who suffers unjustly. So if we want to see the problem of evil played out in really painful terms, Jesus is a great character to look at. We had the book of Job, and of course, Job is presented there as, as a righteous sufferer. We also had back in the book of Isaiah, as you'll recall, and we discussed this in a previous lecture, this idea of the suffering servant that appears most famously in, in Isaiah 53, but also many other passages, a character who um, is beaten and who is physically tortured, but doesn't deserve it. And so what happens when an innocent person is tortured and, and, and hurt and punished in this kind of way of thinking? Um, what happens is that there's righteousness and forgiveness and life that somehow comes out creatively out of that injustice and can even save or help other people. And the book of Job even has a model like this. Job ends up praying for his friends and gets, gets, his, gets his kids and gets his material possessions back at the end of the book. So unjust suffering in these models produces something. It's not just pure, blunt, stupid suffering for no purpose. Um, but rather it means something. And so we've already seen ways that Jesus can very much fit into this pattern and basic Christian theology about what Jesus' death and resurrection means very much takes up these models that Jesus' punishment and his death, his crucifixion, it works somehow for us, for other people, not just for himself. He's not just an innocent victim, he's also a victor. He's the one who gets the victory through the victimhood um, and, and, and there are all kinds of models and, and ways that Christians have thought about that. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but first, things that Jesus said and did and taught that might have relevance for our topic. And by the way, um, for keen readers of the Bible, you might, you might have other passages um, in, the, in, in the Gospels where Jesus says or does things that you think, oh, that's a perfect theodicy passage. Um, that's great. Let me know what they are. Um, um, shoot me an email, but uh, these are ones that I've chosen and, and picked up on because, because of the way that they interact in different ways with themes we've been discussing in these lectures so far. So let's get to it. Let's start with two famous ones where we might just want to be like, wait a minute, does Jesus just solve the theodicy problem right away? Does Jesus just solve it 
through these very passages where he seems to, to address something of our question very directly. First one, John chapter 9, Gospel of John chapter 9. Got my Bible here. As he, Jesus, walked along, he saw a man blind from birth, a man born blind. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There you have it, act consequence. Blindness, especially a, you know, never being able to see at all, being born this way, it's a theodicy problem, friends. You can't have earned something that you were born with. You no, know, you didn't do anything. So, but who sinned, this man or his parents? Maybe, maybe it's a generational curse. Remember that from the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 or Exodus 34. And then Deuteronomy had kind of dealt with this by saying um, no generational curse. And Ezekiel was very much against the generational curse idea for the exilic group. We brought these things up in, in some of the past lectures. So these disciples are just engaging with normal biblical thought along the act consequence nexus here, okay? What's Jesus going to say? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, right there. Could you just trot this out right into the midst of this parade of suffering that we've been looking at and say, Jesus just solves it. It's not a person who sins. It's not the person's parents. People suffer like this just so that God's glory can be shown. You know, and maybe that's a really good theodicy model right there. And then Jesus proceeds to, to heal the man. There are problems, though, with, with just trotting this out and seeing this as a one-shot, one-stop solution to all suffering, as just like Jesus' own singular opinion on theodicy. One is that um, the passage seems very specific in a way. You could say, you know, that this passage is really about, and Jesus' statement is really about, this particular man. Um, this man does it this way, you know, suffered so that I could do this miracle right here. And then he does it. Because the question comes up really quickly. Okay, if... if you know, maybe people who are born blind are born, are born blind so that God's works might be revealed in them, by extension, anyone. How exactly is that happening? Is Jesus healing everyone who's born blind like this man? If you're not healed like this man, then your situation doesn't apply. It isn't the, it's not a parallel situation to the man, okay? So, I don't know. I feel, I feel uncomfortable just trotting this out and saying, oh yeah, Jesus just solves the theodicy problem. It's, it's over. There you have it. Does Jesus ever say anything else like this, though? Well, yes, he does. How about in Luke chapter 13? We have another couple of stories like this. Jesus is walking around with his disciples. Uh, th Luke 13, 1. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. We don't really know what this refers to. This is not an attested historical event. We do know that in Galilee, where Jesus was from, there were a lot of rebellions People would rebel against the Roman Empire. Maybe this is an oblique reference to an event when the Roman government had cracked down on some Jewish rebels who wanted to throw off the yoke of the Roman government. Um, he asked them, Jesus asked uh, those who were with him, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. These are two fascinating stories side by side that seem to be even maybe a little confusing for, uh, for our theodicy problem in terms of like asking the question, is Jesus endorsing the act consequence model, the idea that you, that you suffer, you know, the kind of moral math that you suffer because of sin or because of things that you did. Um, on the one hand, he seems to be saying, were these people who suffered, the Galileans on the one hand, those who you know, died when a tower fell on the other, were they worse sinners than anyone else? Jesus says no. So there seems to be a denial there about act and consequence. They, you know, it's not like lightning just strikes you or a tower falls on you because you sin. So you have that. Okay, that's pretty clear. But then you have the follow-up statements. No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. So Jesus kind of comes back and then says, okay, your perishing really is a consequence of whether or not you repent. So makes it 
um, attendant upon whether the people enter a certain kind of spiritual state or make a certain kind of repentance. That sounds very act consequency. You know what I mean? Like it, it sounds like, and maybe it's deferred. Maybe it's not just in this life where you get where you get the consequence. And of course, here we could just import. I mean, I think a very obvious kind of Christian response to suffering, one that maybe some people can find comfort in it. Maybe for other people, you know, you, you're not comforted by it. I don't know. I don't know who you are exactly, but. I mean, I can say for myself, I, I guess I don't feel like this, 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 this idea I'm about to present do, doesn't really solve the problem of suffering for me as a Christian and just as a person in the world. But, you know, it's this idea that, oh, you can suffer all you want in this life, but life is just fleeting and there'll be an afterlife. And then, you know, for those who are saved, you'll just go on to heavenly bliss. And then everything that happened on this earth will just, you know, quickly fade away. It'll be as though it never happened. And then for others, well... You could say that that the, the very existence of hell creates theodicy problems of its own. Um, er, earlier in one of the readings we looked at from Julian of Norwich, she considered this idea like eternal punishment in hell, like right there. How can God be just when that's happening? Nevertheless, she says all will be well and all manner of things shall be well. She kind of puts it off with her mystical affirmation of God's goodness, almost like a kind of um, best of all possible worlds gesture there by saying, well, God's just going to make everything right. The very theodicy question, though, is predicated on the problem of suffering in this lifetime, what it's for. Um, and so I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I guess I ask you rhetorically, you can't really answer here, but I'm asking you, like, does the thought of an afterlife, either an eternal punishment or a reward, does that comfort you um, that everything will just kind of come out in the wash in the afterlife? Um, so I don't know. I don't really know where we can go with that. Um, and like I said, maybe the problem of, maybe just the problem of hell for some Christians is just so severe, eternal conscious punishment, that that in and of itself makes it sound like it's suffering that goes too far beyond the bounds of what, what sins any one person could have committed in their lifetime. So does that really solve it? Okay, I don't know. Okay, so we have this model. Jesus saying, no, sin and consequence are, you know, action and consequence, not connected. So two cases where Jesus seems to deny that, that connection. Has Jesus really broken it for good? How about two other passages? Um, we'll stay in the book of Luke here. Luke, in fact, stay in the same chapter. Luke chapter um, 13, verses 10 through um, 17. Um, we have a story of a woman who seems to have some kind of illness. Something's wrong with her. Um, and um, Jesus heals her. And I'm not going to read the whole passage except to say that, that the condition that this woman has... She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. Um, it's said twice in this passage to be something um, that is caused by a spirit, Luke 13, 11. And then also verse 16, Jesus says, And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years? Attributing sickness to a satanic attack or to demonic possession. Um, Mark chapter 9 also has a story like this where you have, and Mark has a lot of these stories of demon possessions. They occur in various places throughout the Gospels where someone suffers apparently quite badly and, and apparently for a pretty long time um, precisely because of a satanic attack. So it's not even about a person's sin, perhaps. I don't think there's any sense in this passage, certainly not in the passage in Luke chapter 13, and I, I don't think in the Mark passage, in Mark chapter 9 at least. Um, um, yeah, Mark 9, 21. Jesus asked the Father, how long has this been happening to him, to the Son, this evil spirit that takes a hold of him and throws him on the ground? The Father says, from childhood. Um, and Jesus doesn't say anything about about, oh, you know, your family sinned or this boy sinned or anything like that, but casts the demon out and heals the boy. So this is, you know, this is a very different model from sin, namely the idea that there's a satanic attack. Um, and it's, it's a kind of model for thinking about suffering and theodicy, which is pretty different from thinking about sin in that it's not an appeal to anything like, like Augustine, like famously appealed to original sin as, as the cause of suffering. We sin, human sin, you sinned, I sinned, that's what caused suffering. You're, indeed, you're even born with it coming out of your mother's womb. Sin taints us to that level. It's not clear whether that idea is one that all Christians do or should accept. Indeed, I, you know, some Christians do accept it and some Christians don't, historically. Um, it's not clear that it's a deeply biblical idea or that you could 
totally you know make a slam dunk case for it for this for the, for Augustine's concept of original sin from the Bible itself some people think you can some people think you can't um, but the satanic attack idea is a little bit different because it seems to take take the ball out of the court of you doing the thing and put it in the court of this demonic actor so it's a different kind of a different reason for the suffering um, we also find passages where Jesus seems to affirm the act consequence scheme very directly. Let me go to the one that, where I think it's affirmed most directly. And this is one that people who study this issue will bring up a lot to say, well, okay, Jesus did say who sinned, this man or his parents? None of them. It was just so that the glory of God could be revealed. That's why, people's, you know, that's why people are born blind or suffer. What about John 5, though, verses 1 through 15? We have a story of some people who are, are, are sitting by a pool, and there's a man who had been ill for 38 years, verse 5, really long time. When Jesus saw him, he said, do you want to be made well? And the man said, yes, I do. But there's this kind of magic moment in the pool where an angel comes down and stirs up the, you know, stirs up the water or something like that. Um, and Jesus tells him to stand up and walk, and he does. Um, so the man has some interactions afterward. And later, verse 14 of John chapter 5, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Okay. So there you have it, a very proverbial scheme. Jesus says, don't sin so that another thing doesn't happen to you. I mean, at least with the implication that the sin had caused his original 38-year affliction. If not, with at least an implication that further sin could create future physical problems for the guy. And that's Jesus saying that. So I think, you know, taken as a rash, if, if we're to try to take all, all of these passages we've been looking at as a rational system that can't contradict itself, um, it would seem that Jesus can't be endorsing the idea that sin doesn't cause illness for everyone for every circumstance, but then say to this guy, don't sin or something worse may happen. Or in some of the other passages, you know, the idea that, and other passages we could have examined, where Jesus seems to suggest that some people are going to be destroyed or that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed unless they repent. Because that's an act and that's a consequence. Um, Mark chapter 2 has a, has a passage like this. Luke chapter 21 has a passage where also we could look at it in terms of like, is this an act consequence thing? Although Jesus in, Luke 20, in the Luke 21 passage, which we don't have time to read, brings up the idea that um, maybe people could be martyred. People could suffer. And indeed, martyrdom, which is something we'll explore a little bit more in the next lecture, is yet another model for suffering. Martyrdom being the fact that you die righteously for the faith. Um, I just turned to Luke 21, even though I said we wouldn't read it. Um, and Jesus is talking about this, this, this terrible time when nations and kingdoms will rise up against each other and there will be famines and plagues on earth. Verse 12, but before all this occurs, they will arrest you. He's speaking to his followers here. They will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and you will be brought up before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You'll be betrayed and you'll be hated, but not a hair of your head will perish, verse 18. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. That's a great theodicy passage right there. Jesus is saying, okay, you might be persecuted, you might even be killed, you might be hurt, you might be sold out and betrayed by your family. It would seem as though you are the exact prototypical innocent victim about which the theodicy problem is even a problem. But just wait for it. You will be delivered. Not a hair of your head will perish. Maybe your body will suffer in some way, but your soul, you will save it. So martyrdom, this idea that we would suffer in, uh, te uh, temporarily, not just that we would escape any kind of suffering or punishment as long as we're on God's side, but that in fact God will give us the strength that we need to endure it and then our and we'll be able to save some part of ourselves. Okay. Um, this actually sounds similar to an idea in, in, in the philosopher Plato in one of his writings called the, um, um, called the Apology of Socrates, the philosopher. Socrates in Plato's Apology says famously, you in a very in a way that will prefigure what some of the Stoics would later say, you can't actually harm a righteous person at all. Because if you act, you know, the only, the only way you can har be harmed is by doing wrong things. That's harm. That's evil. That's wickedness. Wickedness isn't someone coming and robbing me and beating me up and leaving me for dead. I didn't do anything wrong. I've kept my soul pure. Okay. We might ask whether that concept, though, of evil and suffering actually makes 
suffering, you know, it, it, it ignores real harm that's done in the world about which or for which we might want to seek justice. Um, so, you know, the idea that, you know, what do you mean righteous people can't suffer? You know, could you be, could you be hurt terribly? Could, you know, could it, go back to Josiah Royce's funeral test. If a, if a close friend of yours or a member of your family was murdered through no fault of their own, would you be able to say they weren't harmed in any way? No harm came to them because they were righteous, they were innocent. It, there was no harm, done. I mean, you know, as, as a sufferer of one who had, you know, a mourner, you might want to say, yes, horrible harm has been done. I'm grieving that harm. I want justice to come, you know, to the perpetrator for that harm. Okay, so um, there's a lot at stake here about whether one embraces this idea about whether righteous people can truly be harmed. Or in the words of Jesus here in this passage, is it the case that, um, you know, you're, you can preserve your soul and really it kind of doesn't matter what other people do to you or say, um, there's, there's, you know, God will deliver you, if not in this life, in the next life, okay? So the, here are some ways we can think about things that Jesus said or did during his teaching in the Gospels. What about bigger kind of concerns? Um, just very briefly, I mean, there's no way I can do this justice, and maybe this is a topic that I can kind of continue discussing in some ways in the next lecture in this series. Um, but what about just the fact that Jesus died on the cross? Does Jesus deal with the problem of evil somehow there. I mean, there are many different things we could say in response to this. I mean, in one sense, we can say that Jesus deeply identifies with the suffering of humanity in that moment of unjust suffering on the cross. We may even have a callback here to the book by Shusako Endo, Silence, um, which we discussed in an earlier lecture here, um, and, and say, oh, okay, this is like the point that, that, that the Jesus voice in the novel Silence makes. Um, the priest is forced to commit apostasy, to step on the image of Jesus, to like stomp on Jesus' face and renounce his faith. And Jesus speaks to him in this moment, right? And says something like, yes, you know, don't worry. Yes. In fact, Jesus says, yeah, st stomp on me, trample it, trample on my face. It is for this reason that I came into the world. It's powerful, right? So Jesus comes to like suffer and to identify with humanity at the deepest, grittiest level. When Jesus is on the cross in, in some of the gospel traditions, like in, in, in the book of Mark, for example, where Jesus' is suffering is, is, is really hard. Jesus is on the cross. Um, this is in Mark chapter 15. Jesus cries out at three, Mark 15, 34. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma samachthani, which means... It's an Aramaic phrase, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, right there. I mean, if you were going to look for like one statement of Jesus where it's like you get the theodicy problem most clearly, I think that's, this, this is a great example. Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? Which is a quote from Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 being a psalm of lament. So what was Jesus' own personal response to suffering in his deepest, darkest moment, in the book of Mark at least, it's crying out from the language of scripture in the voice of lament, God, you forgot me, which is kind of like what the theodicy problem is all about, crying out to God and being like, God, are you watching? Are you watching this whole drama, this whole mess? Have you forgotten? What happened? Jesus himself says that, and that's pretty amazing for Christians to consider, that Jesus, the Son of God on the cross, cries out in despair in that way. Okay, um, I think about the way that, that you know, artwork portrays Jesus' crucifixion. Sometimes you see a lot of, you know, medieval artwork of the crucifixion, which has Jesus on the cross, and he almost looks like he's, his body is perfect. Maybe he has a little bit of wound drop, you know, a little wound dropping, a little bit of blood um, out there. But really, you can already see the resurrection taking place on the cross. But in Mark here, when Jesus cries out something so brutal like this, it seems like he's really in despair, and you're really confronted with the problem of death as a reader. I think of other artwork, like there's a famous piece by Hans Holbein called um, The Body of the Dead Christ in the Tomb, which uh, painted in 1520 for a church scene. This is a Christian piece of art that shows Jesus just as a dead, cold, disfigured corpse. And it's really a terrifying painting to look at. I hope you'll Google it or find it. Maybe I can put a link um, down in, in, in the description here on the YouTube video. So you can cl click on that and look at that painting by Hans Holbein because it's just terrifying to think of Jesus really dying, really suffering in that way and really coming to identify with human suffering, experiencing it. So far from being aloof from the problem of suffering through Jesus, God participates in it 
in, the, in basically the darkest and most humiliating way possible through crucifixion, which is a horrible, horrible way to die. Okay, so how is this a solution to theodicy? Well, maybe it's not. I mean, you could say to yourself, if you were a skeptic, you could say like, okay, so what, so what if Jesus healed some people in the Gospels? He hasn't healed me. He didn't heal my friend. He didn't heal my friend's daughter. He didn't heal my, my wonderful grandmother who died too young. He didn't heal my little sister who died of leukemia. I mean, you know, or you could say, so what if Jesus suffered just as badly as maybe I ever could? How does that help me now? Maybe it's some pie in the sky heavenly thing, but like, I'm, if I'm still suffering, what does it matter that he suffered? Okay. I mean, in a sense, Christian theology about, about the resurrection and the crucifixion is really all about that question. What does it matter that Jesus actually even suffered and died at all? What implication does that have? And these are issues I'm going to have to punt a little bit to the next lecture in this series. But, this, but at least we can't deny this in the Gospels, that Jesus really does suffer and really does identify deeply with the human predicament. You get scenes of forgiveness in Jesus' death too. Luke chapter 23, Jesus famously looks around and says, Father, he looks at the people who are crucifying him and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Introducing yet another theme here that's important for thinking about theodicy and suffering, namely the concept of forgiveness. Um, and in a later lecture, I'll be looking at a book by, by the theologian Miroslav Volf um, called, I think it's called Remembering Rightly in a Violent World or something like that. Uh, maybe that's the subtitle. Um, which in fact asks us to consider this question in the face of the problem of evil. What about forgiveness? Can forgiveness in fact trump, uh, you know, trump the problems that we face in suffering and in evil and all of the things that go wrong and that we do to one another, okay? So Jesus offers this too um, as a model. At any rate, in basic Christian theology, the idea that it's, it is basic normal Christian theology, and you find this all over the Gospels in Passover imagery and in, in various kinds of imagery about sacrifice, going back to the book of Leviticus and at the Last Supper that Jesus shares with his disciples, that Jesus' death and Jesus' suffering mean something for his followers. Namely, that, G, that, that God um, takes suffering onto himself in the person of Jesus, and that that means something for human forgiveness. So on this model of Job and Isaiah and the righteous sufferer and the, and the forgiveness that can even um, have meaning for others, Jesus dies and is able thus through that sacrifice to affect healing and forgiveness on a cosmic level, not just on a personal level, like, oh, because Jesus died, I won't have a headache anymore or something like that, but that cosmically God has made something right in the world, perhaps even in a surprising way, and made good on his covenant promise to Israel and to Abraham and to Sarah and all of the descendants that in fact, um, God would be faithful to Israel in this way. Um, so these are just some, I, I've just, I, you know, there's so much more that we could talk about here in terms of Jesus, but I, I hope I've at least cracked open the door a little bit so that we can see some vistas for thinking about um, the problem of evil in terms of Christianity's central figure, Jesus of Nazareth. All right, that's all for now. See ya.